Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. So in the third chapter of the book of Genesis, so when the woman saw the tree that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said, Where are you? Where are you? Hello? Anybody home? Where are you? The door's unlocked. I came in and I usually do. And nobody's around. Where are you? And this morning I want to preach on this subject matter. Mercy still calls. Thank you for standing in honor to the word of God. And you may be seated I've often wondered what it must have been like to be in that perfect world. A tropical environment, no weeds, stickers, blackberries, predators, pesky bugs, tsunamis, volcanoes, earthquakes, tornadoes, or snowstorms. None of that would happen in the world in which Adam and Eve were planted. None of that would be in the garden that they were a part of. Another set of benefits was there were no grass stains, popped buttons. They didn't even have to worry about ironing their clothes or how much uh, to take off uh, of your to-do list this week. They didn't have to wonder if it would fit or quit fitting. Can you imagine how much time would be gone from your life if you didn't have to shop for clothes or wash clothes or iron clothes or any of that kind of stuff? Or how much would be gone from your budget if you didn't have to take them to the dry cleaners? I mean, that was out of the picture. There was no need. God had put them in a perfect world. What this lets us know is if the mind and the heart are pure, then all things are pure. The Bible says all things are pure to them that are pure. The human benefits were amazing because they had clear minds and consciences, perfect bodies, ideal health and body mass, weight, incredible life expectancy, and an ideal relationship with their God. It was the perfect world. Often I have thought and people have said, oh, if the world was just better, I'd do better. Baloney. That's an old-fashioned way of saying it. Hogwash is another way we used to say it when I was a kid, is that no, perfect world doesn't make a perfect life because Adam and Eve had a perfect world and an uninterrupted relationship with God and somehow they blew it. There was no crime, no rebellion, and I just read today, crime is up 25% in Seattle. They're on a 25-year high in homicides. Uh, uh, Same thing with Baltimore, same thing with New Orleans. All across our nation, crime is high and inflation is up, and and it doesn't matter where you live, prices are up. But there, nobody ever got sick. There were no rebellious children, no broken marriages, no fear, no hiding. None of those stressful things that we deal with did they have to deal with, and yet they sinned. The disobedience to the commandment of God brought a new dimension into living. For the first time in their existence, Adam and Eve experienced the knowledge of good and evil. That tree was called the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, don't eat it. You can't handle it. Have you ever taken on something you thought you could handle and then you got a hold of it and realized it just wasn't all that great? We were sitting at a restaurant. It's called the Island Cafe. And you could sit under these uh, umbrellas and it feels like you're on vacation. And my wife and I often go there in the summertime. It's on Hayden Island. And uh, it's not expensive. It's just a really la- relaxed, casual place. And I was watching this guy go around on one of those uh, electric uh, uh, surfboards. You know, have anybody ever seen one of those? Anybody ever ridden one? Really? You guys are good. 
And I thought, oh, I'd like to have one of those. And we ran into another pastor and his wife, and she said, when I retire, I'm going to do that. And I said, okay. She said, be watching Facebook. And I said, okay, I'll be watching. And then I went home and says, uh, it's a, a hydrofoil, and it's electric. And I thought, well, let's check those out. And, well, the one the guy was riding was $11,995. And it was like, wow, that's <laughs> no wonder I don't see a lot of those around. But it sure looked fun, and so I thought, I'm going to experiment with this. I'm going to look at this. So I read reviews and went on to YouTube and saw this guy, my first try on Lake George in the northeast corner of the United States. I'm, I'm going to ride this thing. And, well, there was 11 minutes of segmented wipeouts of him trying to just get up. And probably after 11 and a half minutes of segmented wipeouts, he finally got up and was cruising at 17 miles an hour. But just because you think it would be cool and easy, it looks easy, but some things aren't as easy as they look to be. The guys that are really good at it make it look so easy. And this guy was going in and out of the boat slips, and he was just making sharp turns, and it was just as quiet as can be. And Mr. Showoff, of course, out in front of the restaurant, making everybody else jealous because they couldn't do that, and making it look so easy. See, sometimes God says, no, that's not yours, that's mine to handle, but we still think we can handle it. It's like us as kids thinking we can do what dad and mom did, that that would be no problem. And it's, a, it's like driving for the first time, and you let them sit on your lap, and then they go, no, 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 you almost hit the pole. And the kid's going, man, the car just doesn't do itself, you know? It just it looks so easy when mom and dad are doing it. It looks so smooth and so nice. But Adam, well, Eve ate, and then Adam ate. And the knowledge of good and evil came, and with it came the realization they were naked. And we see shame and fear and the desire to hide from God. There are so many lessons to learn from this piece of history. There are dozens of sermons that I have preached over the decades uh, using these very verses. Uh, and we live with the forces of darkness that were unleashed on that fateful day. And you name any negative thing that we can think of, whether it's condemnation, conviction, crime, confusion, anxiety, hunger anger, grief, disease, loss, hate, fear, guilt, shame, all of that is associated or attached to that one point where they ate what God told them not to eat. This was not the way that God intended for humanity to live, and it's not the plan that God had for the future of those who obey Him. And today I want to focus not on the actions of the man or the woman anymore, but I want to talk about God and what He did about it. I want us to consider God's response to the sin of man. God went for his typical tour in the garden, and it was a leisurely walk, and those walks must have been really enjoyable. It's like you, you know, you plant your garden, and it's doing good, and you just walk around and say, that looks really nice. You actually put the weed and feed on right, and you don't have stripes in your lawn, and you want to walk out and put your feet in the lawn and say, it looks good, and you enjoy the fruit of your labors, or you finish a project, Jack, and you just enjoy it. I'm confident that as God walked in the garden, he was just enjoying. Uh, the baby animals that were wandering around and the, the birds that were chirping uh, in the, the bushes. and He was just enjoying the fruit of his labors and the fact that things were going really, really good. His plan of multiplication was working uh, and it was as if all things continued uh, as they had been from the beginning. And it's impossible to count the number of days uh, that they had done this or that God had done this because the number of days was irrelevant because there was no intention for there to be an end of these days. You know, if you're always on vacation, then you don't count the days. If this is where you count the days till vacation, <laughs> and then you go, oh, oh, we're halfway through. Oh, no, vacation's over. And we count that because we want and desire and need vacations. We need those times of relaxation. But God never planned for there to be sin or shame or fear or any of these negative things. We do not know what time of the day it was, cool of the day, morning, evening. But God came walking and something was out of place. You ever walk in and you just know something's not quite right? And you say, something's out of place. Then you realize something is missing. Somebody stole something. Something took something away. But what was really out of place probably is that when God came calling, 
Adam and Eve came out. They heard the voice of the Lord in the garden in the cool of the day. And this time they hid themselves. God was walking around wanting to have a, a relationship with them. But what grabs my attention is what God could have done, but what he didn't do. I mean, how would you act? Ah! You know, you just finished the lawn and the neighbor let his dog run around in the middle of the night. Uh huh. And there it is, the deposit. And you never intended to receive it, and you're thinking, come on, guys. Take care of your dog. Don't let him do that on my yard. I don't want that happening. Something is out of place. Or you walk out the door and what would happen if the tree was gone that was once in the front yard? Or you go out to get in your car and it's not there. How violated you would have felt. God knew what was going on. Something was out of sync. Someone was missing. Adam and Eve were not where they normally would have been. God could have come with lightning and thunder. He could have cursed them and killed them and been justified because superior God had said don't. And they did. And I think of how I would have acted as a human. I guess it depends on my mood. It depends on that day. It depends on how critical it was. But God knew they messed up the best thing that ever could have been. This sequence of growth and the sequence of populating the earth and the sequence of this beautiful garden and everything as God intended for it to be. He could have shouted and stomped his feet and turned and walked away. He could have sent lightning and just gone, Shh, fried them. We're done. What would you have done? Oh, I think you know what you would have done. You can see what your past was. We can understand what we were like without God. But instead, God says, where are you? Mercy came calling. God knew all along what was going on. Who God is is revealed in this simple question. The core of the relationship with God is revealed. The passion for right relationship with man is exposed. God loves because God is love and his nature is mercy. Our world needs to hear that. You and I need to hear that, don't we? We don't need the hammer coming down on us. We know there's judgment coming. We know we've sinned. We know we have fallen short. We know we're inadequate. We see all our shortcomings. And they hid. But God says, hey, come, expose yourself to me. Where are you at? God is the God of mercy. Mercy is compassionate rather than severe behavior towards someone under one's power. And the definition in Webster's Dictionary says, a thing to be thankful for. And most often in the Bible, it's about leniency toward the guilty party. Everybody said guilty. Guilty. I was guilty. Were you guilty? Oh yeah, we looked guilty, we smelled guilty, we felt guilty, we lived guilty before when Jesus found us. But I'm so glad he came calling and that I exposed myself to him. Already God had known the danger. He knew what would take place. He had known all along this day would come. And he was disappointed and perhaps even broken hearted. But notice, God didn't speak to the serpent. He didn't call out the serpent and say, come here, I'm taking care of you. No, because he knew the serpent was already destined for eternal damnation. His destiny was already taken care of. God only speaks when there's hope. God only speaks when there's chance of redemption. If you feel God speaking to you, even if it's with conviction, that means you see what you've done and know better and you feel bad about it. It's because he wants to redeem. He wants to restore. He wants to make it better. He wants to take away your fear and your shame. He doesn't want you hiding in the bushes or the trees anymore. He wants you to be face to face with him. I am so glad that I can be face to face with Jesus Christ. I don't have to worry because I've exposed myself to him. Oh, they were wounded and needed and broken. And they had done a pitiful job of covering their shame. 
This is what's interesting to me, is they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves, and when God came, they still hid. Because they knew their attempt at covering their shame was not adequate. They knew that the only solution really was to come clean with God. And God knew that that was the only solution. So it's like you and I, when we come clean with God and we know we have fear and we have shame and we have sin and we don't have to name all the sins because you know all those sins that were in your life and maybe still are crowding into your life. But what Jesus wants is for you and I to just step out from behind everything that's shrouding us, everything that we're hiding behind. We put up our fig leaves. We put up our hands and I I'm not criticizing anybody, but we can give this image that everything, we've got this covered, God. Yeah. I've got it covered. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Ever had your kid, and you that are parents, they, they dress themselves for the first time? And it's like, oh man, they look like an old man, nothing matches. You know, it's just like, what, really? No, you can't, you can't wear that. <laughs> no, we're not going out in public like that. Uh-uh. What are the neighbors going to think of me, their mom, their dad? No, I'm not sending you to school that way. Uh-uh. Not going to happen. So Adam and Eve, they did their best. And it doesn't matter what our best is to cover our shame. It will never, what's on the outside will never deal with what's on the inside. You see, it was an attitude, it was an action that defeated something or destroyed something or killed something on the inside and covering the outside won't fix the inside. I read a brief, brief news article today that the, that the CEO of Bed Bath & Beyond jumped off the Jenga building in New York City and killed himself. And he had just sold a million dollars worth of stock and he still owns six million dollars worth of stock in the company. Uh, he was a multi-millionaire, but he had to close 150 stores and lay off a bunch of people, so he just jumps off a building. And we're thinking, man, dude, if I had money, I'd just go to the Bahamas or something. Forget it. Sell out and go. We think that the things, but there was something on the inside wrong. Everything on the outside, I mean, he's there on the 60th floor of the building. That's where his office is. He he has multiple properties around the the world. Uh, He has things, uh, but those exterior exterior things uh, won't fix what's going on on the inside. It doesn't matter how nice the things they are we possess or how we cover our shame. That's not what Jesus wants. He just wants us to take it off and say, you know what? I do have a hole in the back of my shirt here. I should have worn something like that, huh? It's just like, no, no. We cover up a lot with a jacket, can't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We even think we can cover up our belly. But, you know, it just... You know, just wear the right style clothes and you'll look slimmer. You know, vertical stripes, vertical stripes, no plaid. You know, we'll take care of this. We think that we can cover what's on the inside with what's on the outside. But God knows better. And God was all right with them exposing themselves to him because then he could deal with the issue. Now, we know that God expelled them from the garden and they lost a lot of things. But only God had the answers and only God could heal them because he cared for their eternal souls. And he didn't want them to live in a sinful state forever. That would be the worst thing to live forever in a sinful state. You ever thought about that? I, I read a book one time, and this book was, is that if you die and, and uh, uh, you have a sin, God's going to make you repeat that sin over and over and over for eternity in hell and feel the guilt of it. Now, I don't know if that's true. But wouldn't, what would be the worst thing to do forever and ever and ever and ever? You know, it's like the little kid's book is that the kid wanted his birthday. Oh, it was such a good day. He wanted his birthday every day. And after a while, he got up and go, oh, man, not again. 
Because it gets old. Because you don't want the same day after over and over and over. But the fear and the anxiety. Uh, see, what we often live with before we give ourselves to Christ and expose ourselves is shame. True. Shame's got to be the worst thing in the world. So I don't know what was going on with Mr. Arnold that d jumped off the building. But maybe there was a shame that he failed at the business. And he let all these people down. But he had so much. But what's on the inside is what really counts. Does anybody feel God ever talk to them? Yes. Feel him calling to you? Yes. The only reason he would talk to you is to help you deal with that. So you can come clean with him. And the next time he walks up, you're not hiding. So as you stand with me, I want us to talk about this for just a few more minutes. You see, consider that God could have walked away, panicked, yelled, and raged, ended their life on the spot, just jumped off earth and gone. <laughs> Let's start over. It's kind of like you and I building something out of Play-Doh and going, that doesn't look like the picture on the box. Boom, boom. And we try it all over again. But God chose to redeem humanity. He knew the immediate consequences and the long-term consequences. The impact of all, on all his earthly creation. He understood all that. But he knew that the only way to re remedy it was with mercy. So God says, where are you? And he made Adam say it over here. Why are you hiding? Well, we were naked, so we hid ourselves. Oh, did you eat of the tree? Yes. So that's what God wants. He wants you and I to own what we've done so that he can cleanse us. I'm so glad we're not in the Garden of Eden, aren't you? I'm glad we're living in the dispensation of the grace of God. Where the Bible says we can repent of our sins. And he can forgive our sins. We can be buried in his name. And our sins can be washed away. And we come up with newness of life. And God looks at us and we feel a little bit exposed. But we're unashamed. The greatest thing about exposing your your shortcomings, your sin, your failures to God, is you don't have to hide anymore. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. You know, you owe the person money. <clears throat> so you avoid going to the coffee shop where they eat, drink. You're just like, oh boy, can't go to Thanksgiving now. I borrowed 300 bucks from Uncle George <clears throat> six years ago. <laughs> so I've been eating Thanksgiving dinner at Denny's. Does Denny's serve food? You know? No. And sometimes we can feel that way about God. I don't want any of us to stay away from the house of God because we feel like we owe him something. I want this to be a day where we can all come to the foot of the cross and say, I hear you calling. So here I am, God. Look at me. I'm a mess. Look at me, God. I, I'm not perfect. <laughs> look at me, God. But please look at me through the blood. Thank God for the blood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If we will begin exposing our needs to him, he'll look at it and say, it's about time. You really do need Jesus. I really do need him. So when God asks a question, we have a choice. We can just stay hiding or say, okay, God, here I am. 
Mercy has come calling this morning. Mercy is here. Mercy is ready to act. Mercy wants to take away your reason to hide, your lost years, give you back your moral purity, your sanity. He, he wants to give you that fearlessness of facing life and say, you know what, I don't have to worry about the coming of the Lord. I can look with expectation for the coming of the Lord. I don't have to come into church and say, man, I hope the preacher doesn't preach on sin again. I can come into church and say, thank you, Lord, you've forgiven my sin. I hope I don't come to church and, oh, don't talk about that. Well, today is one of those days we can just open up to Jesus and say, here I am. Is there anybody that just wants to expose all of who they are to Jesus Christ so you can have a conversation with him? I am so glad. Jesus, here I am. Here I am. I give all myself to you.